Ladies and gentlemen, I am Stu Dog, and we are joined today with Cadenza uh, for the um, Technical Difficulties show. <laughs> uh, hopefully we won't be experiencing quite as much, and we might even be able to uh, recite what we saw in the episode in chronological order this time. Because we both has notes, as opposed to just one of us having the notes. <laughs> yes, uh, last time was very... It, it, it was very scatterbrained of me, but uh, I think I think we got the main points that we wanted to talk about. Uh, I wanted. To, I well, wanted... hey man, let's be honest. We were talking about non-linear time. Yeah. Right, in a in a non-linear manner, so uh, it was appropriate. I mean, it, it fit the theme, right? <laughs> it did. And today we're going to be talking about uh, the Next Generation season two, episode nine, "The Measure of a Man." Listen to how organized you are. I didn't even know it was like episode nine. <laughs> you know what I think is interesting when you uh, when we talked about uh, the DS9 opener, uh, you said I think series two or series one, but like in the states we say season. Season. <laughs> yeah. Um, the words are just used like sort of interchangeably here now, but yeah. seasons generally seen as more of a. A U.S. English term, uh, but yeah, a lot of people just call it series over here. So I think I've. It's an I've interesting colloquial into the term. Trap. Oh well, you don't want to fall too far into the British trap. Just ask our friend the Wanderer. <laughs> the Britain, old chap, cup of tea. Brexit means Brexit. <laughs> Imagine being British. Okay, <laughs> so. Um, <laughs> first impressions of this episode, uh, really good, really well written for, like, a season two episode, um, kind of like a smaller scale story, but told in a way where the stakes feel very high. What did you think, Stu? Yeah, I mean, I would totally agree with that. I mean, the... The stakes are very high for just a a single story being told in the space of 45 minutes because you're talking about potentially the death of Mr. Data if things don't go well. And let's be honest, things did kind of look like they weren't going to go well for quite a while in that episode. Yeah, because um, the episode's premise um, and its namesake is a reference to like what is the measure of a man and specifically talking about you know data as uh, an android non-human he does not exactly have the, the or at least his rights are kind of vague at best which it's interesting to me that when this whole thing started going forward with the with Maddox plan to disassemble data like Starfleet gave it the gold star they were like go ahead they didn't even stop to like consider the implications at all and that's the thing I think it comes down to sort of the elements within Starfleet that might be a bit on the the darker side when it goes towards uh, the intelligence divisions that wanted to make secret cloaking devices and things like that. The admirals who were a bit on the the darker and shadier part of the the organization are like, oh yeah, this is fine. We, we'd be quite happy to have entire fleets manned by datas, essentially. I'm sure that uh, Maddox approached it from that angle of like look at how this could benefit us and ultimately even uh picard takes the whole episode to realize what the actual problem is um so we start out the episode and we were talking about this before we started recording but this is actually the first time that we see the officers playing poker together We had, we had to look that up. Yeah, so uh, O'Brien's there as well. Yeah, I thought that was interesting. They invited O'Brien, and uh, 
Data says something about, uh, this game is logical, so therefore I'm going to win or something of that nature. And O'Brien's like, ha, time to pluck a pigeon. That's uh, exactly what he says. He's, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's looking, he's looking forward to, uh, you know, O'Brien is the quintessential sort of everyman character, and uh, just it's really it's really great that he was there. But it's kind of weird that he ne I don't think he ever shows up for another poker game again. It's always uh, just the officers. And that's the thing because he's a non-commissioned officer, so it's unusual to see him at the officers' game. Uh, but I think because he's like so well respected by the crew that they invited him along. Uh, there is an episode where he comments about his his NCO status, and he says something along the lines of, "It means that I don't need to go to dinners with admirals." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can he can avoid those events altogether, uh, but he still has the respect and admiration of everyone he works with. So it's nice to see him there. I and I have to wonder if maybe they had some more uh, planned for O'Brien at first that never really materialized in TNG. Um, because, I mean, by all means, he is a character, but he, like we said in our DS9 uh, retrospective, it was very much like it took him until he was on DS9 to kind of bloom into like a full main character. And I guess um, we should we should probably go over like what's why the Enterprise is where it is, and uh, the the poker game is very interesting. But but let let me just go over it there. The Enterprise is going to uh, Starbase One Seventy Three. Yeah, so we've got. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so we've got a new Starbase there. So. From what I can gather through dialogue, they're quite close to the Romulan neutral zone uh, with that Starbase 173 to sort of remind the Romulans that uh, Starfleet's here and it's keeping an eye on things. And we meet the captain of the base, uh, Philippe Lebois, who is also in charge of the 23rd Sector's Judge Advocate General's office as well so basically she's like space law uh right there to to make sure that everything in the sector goes swimmingly well from a legal point of view as well as a, a federation safety on the border point of view as well well it's important when you expand into space to bring your laws with you but i do have to wonder if the entire reason that maddox was trying to get data here at this star base was because it was so far from everything else. It was a new starbase, and basically they were setting precedents that could be followed. Um, but that's again getting getting ahead of ourselves. There, uh, Picard is on the space station while this poker game goes on, as he he doesn't join until the very last episode. But <laughs> he uh, he's having a little cup of tea, you know, in the. In what looks like some kind of lounge for officers, and uh, that's when he first sees Philippe Levar. Philippe, how do you pronounce it? Philippe? No, that's a man's name. Philippe Louvois. Philippe Louvois. Right. Um, Sounds French. <laughs> I, that's probably Just why they get along so well. They they like their wine together. Um, <laughs> And we have a little bit of dialogue between them, and it looks like Picard is very happy to see her, but when he approaches her, he's like, you know what I'd want to do if there wasn't all these people here? And I was like, oh god, what? And she is like, hit me over the face with a chair, and he's like, after that. Like, <laughs> like there's, there's obviously <laughs> something going on. Together. There's obviously something going on here. Uh, it, she's one of Picard's uh, previous flames, and they had quite a falling out because, as you mentioned, she is like the Judge Advocate General here, or the, uh, she is the law, you know, so she, I didn't know that there were Starfleet officers who just like practiced law, but I guess in any sort of military you have sort of your own 
court system, you know, like that you can uh, charge people with things like separately from the civilian courts. And uh, we've heard a little bit at this point of, of John Luke Picard's uh, experiences on the Stargazer, but w like all I remembered going into this episode is that the Stargazer was destroyed. Um, and after I think Picard took command, and uh, for that he is given a court martial by his love, or former love, and it's it's very much like the stressing point of this relationship because he thinks that she went a little bit too hard in the paint and she is like this is my job this is like you know like you're you're a captain of a starship and i practice law that's what i do every like we had to give you a court martial because you lost a ship you know like it was no but it was at the same time it was the loss of a ship during battle uh an enemy ship had unprovoked attacked uh, the Stargazer and Picard managed to outwit the enemy and he ordered to abandon ship because the ship was on fire and fire consumes oxygen so um, they wouldn't be able to breathe so uh, you know he had to get out of there and take all the shuttles and escape pods back to Federation space. And that's where the Picard maneuver came from, I believe. Right? He Yes. He used a bit of guile <laughs> to outmaneuver the enemy. And it's like, you know, uh It's like a situation of he was treated unfairly, definitely, but the letter of the law was that he needed to be court martialed. And it really does say a lot for his character that he was still promoted through the ranks despite this like BS uh court martial on his record and even then getting command of a galaxy class starship which at the time was the most advanced ship of the fleet the flagship of the entire federation you know uh it's it's interesting to see that even early on the writers were uh, interested in making Picard like a little bit less than perfect and kind of like the difference between him and Kirk because Kirk could like break the law uh, hundreds of times and, and probably never actually see the inside of a courtroom but Picard does the right thing that is technically wrong and he gets you know uh, he gets a court martial for it so court martialed for it yeah, uh, I, I wanna I wanted to bring something up. Uh, one of the things that uh, Louvois says to Picard is that, you know, after all this time, I'm glad to see that you're a pomp, you're still a pompous ass and a damn sexy man. <laughs> uh, she she has a way of like. They have a way of like flirting with each other and then immediately turning to like hostility. <laughs> I had that quote written down as well. <laughs> like hostile flirting. <laughs> so uh, they're on the star base, right? And uh, Picard and her are catching up, and then all of a sudden, uh, an admiral. I, I didn't write the admiral's name down, but he, the admiral comes up and he's like, "I want to see the Enterprise," and Picard's is like, "Oh, right this way, sir!" Like. Uh, I guess it's <laughs> it's kind of just the Admiralty just uh, using their rank to do personal projects or whatever. He just wanted to see the Enterprise. <laughs> yeah, uh, he didn't give any other reason or any other th anything besides that. But he he brings Commander Bruce Maddock uh, with him, and he tells Picard that you know he has a proposition for him, but that can wait because he really wants to see the Enterprise right now. And. Uh, they go on to the, the bridge of the Enterprise, and uh, the Admiral is just like, Oh, wow, this ship is great. Every ship that has bared the name of Enterprise has become a legend. This one will too. And meanwhile, uh, Data, when he turns to see who's coming out the elevator, because it's, you know, Admiral on the bridge time, like, he's got to show respect. He sees Bruce Maddock. Yeah, right, leans out the, the turbo lift and yells that. <laughs> they barely ever do that. Uh, they barely ever 
acknowledge the captain on the bridge, which I guess you know it's a little bit different in your your sci fi ness, but I, I I believe in the mili- in the actual like navy. Uh, every time the captain comes on the bridge, you like announce it. So it w- that was a cool detail that they did that for the admiral. I don't think Picard really cares too much for the formalities like that. Um, but Data turns and he sees Maddock and is instantly like Maddock is his eyes are glued on Data. He's like sizing him up. He's, yeah, yeah, and and Data is like. Oh my god, not this guy again. Like <laughs> he doesn't have any emotion on his face, but you can read that what he's uh what he's thinking is why is this guy looking at me like this? Oh no. Uh he Maddox gives him like the stop the stalker look and he kind of creeps data out a little bit. And he uh I believe when Admiral turns around and says um Commander Bruce Maddox is here to do some work on your android. Yeah, he makes it sound like they're they're popping the car into the shop or something, you know? Like, the Admiralty in uh, TOS and some of these early epi- episodes of TNG is just, like, really sleazy. <laughs> they seem to be really sleazy. But, uh... So, you know, Picard's like, he has this look like, w- what the fuck's going on here? And Maddock approaches Data, and he's like, How have you been, Data? And Data says something like, My condition does not alter with the passage of time. <laughs> Just the most non-answer, the most non-answer he could give. <laughs> so when he goes on to say that, that Maddox was part of the panel who evaluated Data when he applied to join the Academy, and he was the sole member of the panel to oppose his... Uh, joining to Starfleet Academy on the grounds that he's not a sentient being. And instead of calling Data him, he proceeds to call Data it for pretty much the whole episode. Right. I don't like this guy. Yeah, <laughs> they set him up to be very adversarial in because to the audience watching this, like especially for the first time, They've grown to, like, see that Data is not just a machine. Like, yeah, he's cold and calculating, but he's got, he's got, like, a spirit, you know? He's got, like, I guess a soul, you know? Like, he has this ineffable quality to his being that is more than just talking to a computer, you know? Like, it's, it's not like... Like, if we use a modern-day example, like, talking to an AI uh, that uses... No, Data's deaf. Oh, sorry, what did you say? Data's definitely got a personality of sorts. Yeah, and it's, a, it's, it's definitely, like, not human, um, but this is a federation full of all kinds of crazy life, and... The precedent that we're setting here by like taking an officer and just disassembling them to find out how they work is pretty messed up. And Data is rightly, uh, because Maddox tells him that his plan, that I think him, uh, Riker and Picard and Data all sit down and he's like, Oh, tell me about this proposal of yours. Like, Picard, ever the, the fucking diplomat, is really trying to, uh, sort of figure out what's going on here because there's this past history between Maddox and Data and uh, it's like Picard is obviously going to be on Data's side but the way that the way that they go about it is like he he very organically comes to that conclusion Um, yeah because Picard says that when they have that meeting they're like I don't consent to Starfleet disassembling, studying, analyzing, and then trying to replicate Mr. Data. <laughs> right. It's it's like it's a moral quandary that nobody seems to acknowledge at first. But uh, this when Maddox turns to Picard is like, "Yeah, I kind of thought you'd say that." So here's the orders for Data to be reassigned to me. Yeah, and it's 
through a roundabout way, like, he's going to get what he wants, no matter what. And that's the impression that we get, is that we're fighting a losing battle here, because we, the audience, know that Data is more than a machine, and the people on the Enterprise know that, but they have to prove it, which is why it escalates into this whole bigger situation. Um, and after, I think after uh, Maddox and Picard and Riker and Data, they have that sit down and he explains the process. Data is like, no, like, I don't think you have the technical expertise to actually uh, be able to reconstruct my memories in a way that's going to be satisfactory to me because he's like explaining it um and he doesn't really have like a lot of detail about how the process is actually going to work he just he's he mentions a specific part of the engineering that wasn't able to be replicated successfully he's like have you found a way around that and maddox is like oh yeah well um when i take you apart i'll work it out then just kind of yeah weird. i mean it's like it's it's, like, it's, it's kind of like uh you know uh telling a patient in like a doctor's office yeah we don't know what's wrong with you but we're gonna open you up and find out like i said it is a exploratory surgery but it's it's a very invasive uh to put it lightly and uh potentially data could die from this uh in the way that he could die, meaning his circuitry, his physical body, his memories could all be corrupted and not f fit back together the way that they're supposed to. Um, so he, he rightly refuses, and a scene after that, we have Picard kind of... Stu he's studying something on his little laptop. By the way, I love those little swivel laptop things that they have in TNG. <laughs> they're just so, they're just so cool and like for the time you know that people are like that's what the future's going to be like. We're going to have little tiny laptops. But and now that future is here. <laughs> yeah. And now we have little laptops that are in our pockets all the time, little supercomputers and it the, it's besides the point. It's it's just a little detail. I love the little uh computery things, but uh He's, like, trying to find something in uh, Federation law about the transfer of officers. Um, but he had called Data yeah. into his office. There's... Yeah. No, go, go ahead, because I oh, think sorry. we're about to pretty much quote the same part of the episode. <laughs> right. It's, it's a very good line, actually, and I remember when first hearing it. Um, you know, he uh, Picard invites Data in because he wants to get his perspective on all this because, you know, nobody's asking Data what he wants, really. And it, Picard is basically like, well, I have to consider, like, Starfleet's interest in this, you know? Like, you are an officer, and, like, if I have to order you to do something that, you know, is risky or something, like, it's... That's just part of the life. And Data is like... uh isn't is Jordy's visor superior to like human vision? And Picard's like, well, yeah, it's very superior. It's like, okay, well, then why aren't all the human crewmates like required to get their eyes removed and replaced with cybernetics? And Picard just kind of like mulls that over for a minute. He's just like, yeah, I thought that. <laughs> I've got that exact quote written down as well. <laughs> he says, yeah, Data realizes that Picard has no answer for him. He's like, I see. It is because I am not human that the circumstances are different. And it's like, you, uh, my heart breaks for, for him in that moment because he, he might not have any emotions to feel the the weight of of things but data doesn't want to die you know he doesn't want to lose his memories of the people that he cares about you know like he uh he's he's like in an impossible situation and 
Picard has no more words for him, so he, like, dismisses him. And then he goes back to looking into the transfer orders and if there's the, any the legal way around that. transfers of officers. <laughs> right. Well, then he goes and sees uh, Livois in her office, and she's like, Hot damn! <laughs> Twice as much in one week or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like a fine piece of ass just walked into my office and Picard's like look a that... fine piece of damn pompous ass <laughs> <laughs> she's uh, she's very flirty and he's just like look not now okay <laughs> I got some I got some serious business and he is like I can't I make any sense I can't I can't make any sense of this gobbledygook and he throws the pad on her desk so she says that data can refuse the procedures, but they're not able to stop the transfer of officers. Which makes sense, you know. It's uh, it's military hierarchy. Really, the only sort of option would be for data to resign. Which uh, he he prepares to do. Um, Picard looks very crestfallen when he realizes that data, one of data's only options here is to potentially resign. But he kind of is, he kind of, you know, it's better than being disassembled. Um, and I, I believe the scene after that, we see Data in his his quarters, which I've always maintained that Data has some really nice quarters. Like, he's got enough space to keep a cat, so uh, as a cat owner, I know how much space that is before they go crazy. <laughs> and on a starship, he's got some decent quarters. Um, but... He's going around and kind of, he's accepted that he needs to resign to resolve this issue. And uh, he's packing away things in this little tiny plastic container. Uh, yeah, like the smallest little <laughs> toolbox. Did you notice that one. too? <laughs> I noticed that too. It was so small and so like, he could only fit exactly what they had put there. And I think... Uh, Picard's book that he picks up for a second is actually like too big so he just sets it down and uh, he goes he goes to the other room for a minute um, you know it, you have to ask yourself if Data is just a machine right like uh, why does he need quarters with like a bedroom and an office space and a cat you know you mean like, um, like the way that in Futurama Bender's apartment is just like this little cupboard <laughs> well, he's a robot, you know? He doesn't need that much room. Uh, but, like, you, you kind of have to ask yourself these things as you're seeing this person pack their things away. You know, like, it's at, it's kind of relaying to the audience that, yeah, this, this person is more than just uh, a bunch of gears and circuits, which... The, more than just the sum of their parts, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he, he has a little hologram of... Tasha Yar, I thought that was sweet because I had, I had kind of forgotten that they had bonded a lot because they were both kind of uh, I don't want to say like outcasts, but they were both like different enough that I think that they had a little something special between them. Uh, and that's the thing that she sort of she kept people's arms length because she was quite quite guarded about how she was because of the the nature of the way that she grew up on a, a rough, really rough sort of failed colony world. Yeah, you have to wonder why the Federation has whole planets with just like roaming, like El Rapa gangs. You know, like <laughs> there's a there's a little episode. Um, I think it's season one, because yeah, Tasha dies in season one, doesn't she? Uh, there's a there, she has a flashback to the planet and she's just like running away in the rain from like literal bands of Fallout 3 raiders. <laughs> it's just it's just weird to think that in this utopian society they have entire worlds that are basically Mad Max. Right? <laughs> anyway, uh he, he looks at Tosh's hologram for a minute and then puts it away with the rest of his things. Um, goes to the other room. And then douchebag Maddox uh, just bursts in. 
and he picks Dang, up. He just walks right in. Yeah. It's it's very talks disrespectful. Talks his way past the lock. <laughs> I honestly like uh, that's one of those things that I think bothers anybody is when somebody enters without permission. It's like you know, I mean, Data Data is an android. He has he has no uh, ability to feel shame, but he could have been naked. You know, he could he could have been naked. He could have just gotten out of an oil bath for all Maddox knew, and. <laughs> But he does say that to Maddox. He says, isn't it customary to ask permission before entering someone's quarters? It's weird how, like, Data has no uh, emotional inflection, yet you can feel the cutting edge of his words. You can feel that he really dislikes Maddox and the way he treats him. Brent Spiner is, is just very... His whole thing with Data has... I mean, he's just way better than Anthony Daniels, I'll say that much. <laughs> <laughs> and playing a, a robot with emotions, or no emotions. Um, and it's... Maddox came to, to kind of work things out with Data, I believe. He wanted... It's weird, he doesn't see him as a person, and yet he wants to have a conversation with him to get him on board with the idea. And that's when Data breaks the breaks the whole thing by saying, like, well, I've resigned, so yeah, we're not gonna do the procedure. And he basically tells him to uh kick rocks because I he's like, I am not nobody is in charge of me anymore. <laughs> Good day, sir, you get nothing. <laughs> Says that if uh if he underwent the procedure and they weren't able to put him back together again, then something unique and wonderful would be lost. Yeah, he says, you know, you might retain the uh, factual events of the memories, but the flavor of the moment could be lost forever. Not and the actual consciousness. Yeah, it's it's some heavy stuff because, like, when especially when they get later into the trial, it's like a lot of these questions are things that human beings ask themselves like all the time. Because what is a man except the uh, accumulation of his experiences? And if you take that away from somebody, you're taking away their, basically their everything, you know? Like, it's, uh, and despite the fact that Data is a machine, like, he's, he's being treated extremely unfairly. Um, but he... When Maddox is explaining, like, what this procedure could possibly mean for the Federation, like, having a data on board every starship, you know, like, having a supercomputer android um, that can perform things faster than everyone, not be affected by biological weapons or agents, and, you know, put into situations that would be hazardous for living beings to uh, be at, it's like... It makes a lot of sense from his perspective, right? But like, I want to bring I want to bring something up um, that is a little bit off topic. But uh, in Star Trek Picard, I've I've I haven't watched very much of it because I didn't like it. But uh, there's like an android uprising. Like they have they literally make a bunch of positronic data clones, kind of that all look and kind of act like he did before he started to develop this personality. But I thought that by the end of this episode, they had set a precedent that that would be wrong. So, like, what changed? Yeah. I wonder the same thing, because um, I've also noted that down, that you see something similar as far back as Voyager as well. Uh when the doctor finds out that all of the the emergency medical holograms of his type are no longer medical holograms but they've all been put on mining duty yeah he gets he gets beamed to the alpha quadrant uh through some technological gobbledygook and uh, <laughs> he ends up seeing that you know they're all being so it's like 
Starfleet definitely has a need for disposable people. And it's not... I guess it's not surprising to me that um, in, in Star Trek Picard that that is the case. However, I just thought... I thought that this was like kind of a, a cornerstone of why that would not happen which is why I don't I don't think the Federation in Star Trek Picard is like it's not the same Federation you know what I mean like it's almost like it's been taken well, I know over exactly what you mean um, the Federation in Picard is it seems a lot darker maybe because it's it's had wars it's it's been through the Borg attacks and stuff like that. And yeah, it's kind of like America during the Cold War. A sort of, um, we need to be a bit nastier to survive kind of thing. Or just modern uh, imperialist America. But yeah, it's it's like, I, saw, I really don't like that about it because um, there are always bad apples in Starfleet, but... Uh, I tend to think that the majority of people in the actual organization are like people like Picard, you know, or Cisco or Janeway, like good people who follow uh, the Federation's ideals as far as it can get them. Um, but in Picard, it just seems it seems like uh, they, at some point, they threw out everything that happened with Data in this episode it, with some kind of new legal precedent that made it okay. Uh, which is, like, starting out watching Star Trek Picard, that was something that really bothered me because we don't get to see why that happens. We just get to see that things are different now, but we don't get an explanation about yeah, why. Yeah, we just know that um, there are sort of uh, soon type androids there obviously based off of data's design they look like they are they look like they are like data but not but it's weird because they have an op uprising which would lead one to believe that they are sentient right why would starfleet make a bunch of sentience soon androids when we had a legal precedent set in this episode that it was wrong we never got to see that, and I, I just, I honestly feel like the writers for Star Trek Picard just never watched Measure of a Man. Or maybe they did watch it and they just didn't get the message behind it. Maybe they didn't. Maybe they thought Maddox's idea was like a really good one or something. Uh, oh, we can have androids. Uh, yeah, our armies of androids. It's a shame that Maddox got beaten at Court of Law. It's a shame. Oh. <laughs> Ugh. He, no, I mean. Maddox is painted as the bad guy the whole time, but by the end, we kind of understand him a little bit better. And uh, so, getting back to uh, yeah, so Measure of the Man, he goes to Levois, and uh, they look for like a legal sort of remedy for for Data to be taken to his lab to be disassembled, and Picard's there, sort of fiercely defending Data, and. I think it's uh, Maddox that says, "It's like you're you're just uh, prescribing this level of humanity to Data because it looks human. It would be a different story if it was a box on wheels. Wouldn't have the same level of respect then." Yeah, if he was just like a, a rolling trash can like R two D two, he wouldn't be Bonk. prescribed. <laughs> he wouldn't be prescribed these kind of things, but. You know, we as the audience, again, we know that that's not true. But his arguments are compelling. Like, that's the thing, is like, it's not like he's operating from a illogical position. Like, he's, his points are very well thought out. And it kind of makes the viewer question a little bit, like, is Data a person? Or is he just a, a sophisticated machine that can accurately act like a person? And that's the thing that he says, that uh, there definitely is value in the thought of every ship in Starfleet having a data aboard. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a bad thing to have more 
but to risk the one and only on the chance that you can make more is not right. <coughs> I think that also falls back into um, the sort of the Vulcan logic of things as well. Uh, the <coughs> needs of the many outweigh the needs of the one, therefore dismantle the one so that we can build many. Yeah, it's a it's sort a logical position. Slots in with that, doesn't it? Uh-huh. Um, so there's a there's a <laughs> there's a scene. Uh, we we ha this whole episode is very like dry and serious about the nature of like what's going on. But we have this one scene where it cuts to data uh, at in ten forward with uh, I think it's Riker, uh, not Deanna. Or maybe it was Deanna. Anyway, he's no, in... I don't think Deanna is in this episode. I don't remember seeing her at all. But uh, Dr. Pulaski's there. Right. I had to I had to look up her name again because I forget that she's, like... She replaces uh, Beverly Crusher for a while. Um, but, uh... Yeah, Data's friends are there. W Worf isn't there either, which is... Or wait, no, he is! Sorry. He, that's, like, the one scene he's in this episode. Yeah, because Worf gave him the present. Yeah. It's a book. Yeah. If I recall correctly. Yeah. So they're they're throwing Data a, a goodbye party because he's resigning from Starfleet as far as they know. And uh, Worf g gave him a present and he's very meticulously like opening uh, each side so that he doesn't rip any of it. Um, and I think it's Wesley who is like, uh, Data, you're, you're supposed to rip it open. He's like, with a little bit of care, Wes. The paper can be used again. And I instantly had flashbacks to, like, my childhood Christmases. Don't be able to paper! We could use it again! Like... <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, Dale, you're missing the point. And then he just tears... <laughs> he tears it he up. He just rips it in <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's, it's a much-needed scene of uh, a little bit of humor injected into this very uh, serious episode. And, uh, you know... Speaking of heavy drama, uh, Data realizes that Geordi is kind of sitting by himself, just mulling over the situation, over his drink. Yeah, so in, in my notes here, I've just got written, Geordi is a big sad. He's he's very upset. <laughs> he's, he's, re he's, really, he's, he's really sad, yeah. Well, it's like, um, Geordi and Data at this point are, like, best friends. Like, they, they work together a lot. They have mutual respect in like an official capacity, but they've also started to bond as friends. You know, like he's uh, Lafort. Yeah, he's Watson. Yeah, he's Watson just exactly. <laughs> you, you knew where I was going with that. Um, so it's it's like it's really sad to see that because it, like Jordy thinks the data is just going away. He doesn't even know that Maddox is trying to make it so that he can still keep Data's property, you know, and, uh, Data kind of cheers him up, and they, they say, they say, like, goodbye and stuff, and it's, it's very sweet, uh, Jordy and Data's relationship is, like, uh, top tier, I love it, um, and I believe this is where, uh, the episode transitions into more of the court stuff, because Picard, uh, I believe Lavoie has decided, based on her findings in the past, like past laws and precedents that have been set, that Data is Starfleet property and therefore Maddox can take him uh, because he's a toaster. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it says basically the only way to sort of work things out would be to convene a court hearing but at that time, she she doesn't have any staff, so to sort of take the senior staff of the Enterprise uh, with Picard representing Data as defense and Riker as the prosecution. Which is really messed up. <laughs> like, I can understand... Yeah, I've noted down here that um, because of Riker's friendship with Data, like, that's a massive conflict of interest to have him sort of doing you would that. you would but think she does, so she does sort of threaten that if she sees that Riker's sort of doing a sloppy job or uh,
beer, then she'll just go with summary judgment. And her summary judgment is that Data is a toaster. Have him report to Maddox immediately for experimental refit, which obviously no one wants that to happen. Not even her, I don't think. Well, ex except except Maddox. He wants it to happen. Right. <laughs> I don't think she personally wants to take Data away from Picard because she knows it'll hurt him. However, she has to follow the letter of the law. So there, it's like their, their conflict that was set up in the beginning of the episode comes up again. And you can see, uh, pick, like, Riker, he refuses outright. And then he's basically told, uh, if you don't do this... And he says that. He's like, no, no, I yeah, won't. I won't do it. And he's like, fine, I don't have a choice then. And she's like, you, you don't have a choice. No, this is the way we do things. And you can see Picard, like, kind of put himself in front of Riker because he's like, they're both... He's like, don't worry, she's kind of a bitch. Just, it's fine, you know? Like, it'll be all right. And uh, he is like... She she says something to them about just remember to like do your duty, um, because you're both like if you both don't give it a hundred percent like I won't take this seriously, and uh, Picard says just you know just remember to do your duty as well. Don't worry yeah, about you us. You remember to do yours as well. <laughs> and she's like I I never have not back then and not now, so it's like she's not stepping down. Uh, the stakes have been set, uh, and it's, man, like, there's a scene where Riker is, like, he's, like, computer access, the, all the information about Lieutenant Data, and he's, like, going through Data's schematics and stuff like that, and he, uh, he does, like, a little smile as he's, like, reading and, and seeing all this information about Data, because it's like this, I don't know, I kind of took that as him being like, the the way that people treat it's like, data. It's a eureka moment, like he's worked out what he needs, but then you see that smile just like, turn into sort of like a, like, a realization of what he has found, to do. He's found the gotcha moment. And he's not really happy about finding it. No. I I think that moment was very uh, telling of Riker's character because he's he's very like he like he said he's a he's a conflict of interest, but because of the circumstances, like he needs to do this and he needs to give it a hundred percent. If there's any chance of saving data, he needs to act as the prosecution and demonstrate why data shouldn't be saved which is just terrible <laughs> sometimes they give the hardest choices yeah, to Riker <laughs> yeah uh, so Riker's look while studying data so then we get to the, the actual uh, hearing where we're basically trying to figure out whether data is uh Starfleet property or, or not, right? Or whether... The, the hearing is kind of about whether he is alive and sentient and enough to have rights and not, like, a machine. But it's also about whether he belongs to Starfleet as property or not. And I think Maddox did a very... In one of the previous scenes, he did a very interesting uh, logical trick where he was like, would you permit the Enterprise to refuse... A refit like the enterprise computer would you uh allow them to deny getting a refit and like their memory banks wiped or something like that um yeah and lavoie says but that's different because the enterprise computer is starfleet property uh, yeah and that's how that's all the whole thing about built and assembled by the fleet right that's how the whole thing about property gets started and uh it, i mean it is an interesting discussion because uh with any kind of link back to history, I mean, often people have been ascribed the label of someone's property, and we in the modern era don't believe that that is right, but there are still places in the world where it is very much a thing where someone can own another person, and uh, it's, it's sort of 
like, you sort of get the impression that that's where they're going with it, but Picard doesn't have... He doesn't realize this at first, because the the actual hearing is kind of going all over the place. Uh, and you want, you want to talk about what Riker does to demonstrate that uh, Data is not... He's just a puppet, you know? Like, he's just in a... He, at first, he, he like, describes yeah, so what an automaton is. They're in the is. courtroom. I'm sorry. As according to Webster's Dictionary. <laughs> 24th century edition. Yeah, so it's when, when Data takes a stand and Picard insists that they, they let the computer read out uh, Data's sort of biographical information and it goes into the fact that he's received multiple medals for uh, entry and valor and uh, it lists out all the all the medals that he's received for it over the, the time in the fleet but Riker sort of in a very sort of adversarial way um, starts speaking to Data about his technical specifications I've noted down there that his total memory size and it's interesting because it's in sort of 1980s terms uh, so back back when sort of Atari STs were going about but his total memory capacity is 800 quadrillion bits can I we do a conversion like uh yeah we need to convert that hold uh, on let right me now, right I'm so, gonna I'm gonna try that 800 quadrillion I don't even know how many zeros is that quadrillion Oof, I don't know either I just try typing it out as a full word <laughs> I'm sure somebody has done it somewhere wow so here we go so um, autofill saying in terabytes or well, let's put in gigabytes that's easier for me to understand Oh, come on, just give me a conversion. Well, um, while we're doing that, I just... Just to put in perspective, he he has uh, 800 quadrillion bits of memory, and then uh, 60 <laughs> trillion uh, capable of 60 trillion operations per second. Yeah, uh, it says it says on Wikipedia, um, at most current microprocessors can execute at least a million instructions per second. So data it can do uh, 60 trillion per second, while modern computers apparently can only do about a million per second. Just to put that into perspective, <laughs> he could he could be he could be running so many mods on Fallout New Vegas and somehow not crash. <laughs> that sounds like a great use for uh <laughs> Android. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just open up the back, but, he's got um, a screen. Yeah, so Riker, uh he brings in this massive lump of he describes it as being a sort of like fu future version of uh, a heavy sort of steel alloy uh, but he has a bar of this stuff and he gets data to to bend it to show his level of strength uh, Picard objects because it's like well a lot of species have high levels of strength but Levois dismisses the objection and, uh, she doesn't really give a reason why either. Like, I feel like Picard's point was actually kind of on point quite there. Valid. Yeah, it was. But she kind of dismisses I mean, it out of hand. That, would that be like sort of objection, uh, sustained kind of thing? I think so. I think uh, she wanted to see where Riker was going with it. She wanted to let him cook. So then. Uh, it shows that data can be disassembled down into component parts by removing his hand 
uh, right in front of them, which, I mean, yeah, if they're viewing data as being property at that time, fine, but being that they're in that sort of middle ground, I don't think that was appropriate, because, I mean, that that's basically like a physical assault almost. Yeah, but, I mean, if you're if the question of whether he is a person or not has not been answered, kind of like taking his hand away is. I mean, imagine doing that to a person, just like, you know, uh, like Isaac, when Isaac like uh, took Gordon's leg on the Orville. Oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> I was playing a prank on you, Commander. By amputating his leg in the middle of the night. <laughs> well, to be fair, I would, uh, I mean, I'd be horrified, but I'd probably laugh about it too. <laughs> it's a good prank. It'd be funny in the morning when it's grown back. <laughs> yeah, but they, they, uh, you know, Data got pranked, and then Riker, like, concludes his, uh, he concludes his yeah, statement so... by turning him off. Yeah, so they say that, uh, Data was created by a human to serve human needs and human purposes. Uh, he's a man-made machine and he's got an off switch and he, he switches him off and he just says, Pinocchio has been broken. Its strings have been cut. It's like, oof, what a line. He, he, he delivers it too with such conviction that I don't think anybody could have could have possibly thought that he wasn't that he was holding back you know it's it's a great performance by Jonathan Franks but it's it's like it's Picard is literally he's like freaking out at this point you know because he realizes that Riker's in argument the very is good. next scene uh, he says to Guinan in 10 forward that Riker delivered a devastating presentation. It was devastating. And Guinan's like, really? That bad, huh? And he's like, yeah, I'm not sure we're going to win this now. Um, because he's, like, you can sense that Picard is kind of having his own doubts at the moment. Like, he, he believes that Data is, is more than just a machine. But how do you argue against turning it off you know like turning the man off like people don't have an off switch I, I i guess unless you count like a bullet to the brain or something but <laughs> that's there's not an there's not an off on <laughs> switch you know and it's like it's interesting that he calls a recess and he immediately goes uh to 10 forward to talk with Guinan because Guinan is just this special person to picard and whenever they're together it seems like 10 forward is like closed or something because it's just them and yeah it's very it's always very personal uh between the two of them and like he uh he's going to her for help and Guinan has like, this way of talking right oh sorry it's almost like uh Picard trusts Guinan uh who's a civilian he trusts her more than he trusts Troy who could generally be the person that he should be going to. But um, he goes to Guinan to, to talk about issues and sort of problems that he's having. See, the problem with Troy is that she's a ship's counselor who can beam directly into your soul and know what you're feeling. So, like, it's not about working through things with Troy. It's about admitting to things that she already knows. Like, it's... It's, I don't think someone like Picard particularly wants to be read by a Betazoid and told what to do or, or whatever, you know? Like, he... Troy handles things gently enough with the rest of the crew, but Guinan has this unique perspective where she is old, she's, like, one of the last of her kind, and yet she chooses to be here, like, as a bartender on the flagship, like... She's there, I think she's there to, like, watch out for Picard, more or less, in her own way. She she might have other reasons for being there, but she's always the one that, that he goes to for guidance in his times of need. And I don't remember how they uh, get on to the, to the subject, but 
they start talking about how like a race of datas like what would that look like and that's there's lots of species throughout the universe or throughout the galaxy that have used disposable people and she uses that word and it's like yeah and the, then the card turns around and says you're you're describing slavery yeah for like some he historical just, context, he, knows that he doesn't. He doesn't want that to be the outcome of the situation. No, I mean it's it goes against everything he fundamentally believes in, and everything the Federation is supposed to stand for. And yet, it's being obfuscated behind these other issues, when the real issue is that Data is not only a person, a unique and an individual. He is going to be sold into slavery. And if they accomplish what they're trying to do to make more of them, they will also all be slaves. Because they will be property of Starfleet. Like, that's what this is about. And it's 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 interesting how it took Picard quite a while to get to that point because of his own Federation beliefs and, like, biases. He needed the outside perspective of a civilian like Guinan, you know, like she's uh -huh. she's not Starfleet. She offers this perspective that he didn't consider, which, but is the main thing that is the problem here. So it's when he goes back into the courtroom and sort of he introduces the beginning of his argument. And the few things that I've got noted down here is that he describes uh, like life as being machines as well, just machines of a different type, uh, organic machines. And he states that children are created by their parents, but they're not property like Starfleet would have data being. And it's ultimately, like, in a federation of thousands of different species that are all different, like, what is the major difference between uh, the machine of biology and the machine of wires and circuits and, you know, ultimately, like, if, if you think about it, the computer itself is just a compute like the brain is just a computational machine you know like it's a very very complex one one that we haven't been able to like fully uh, uh like recreate i mean that's what data is <laughs> even in the 24th century they haven't been able to recreate what the brain is capable of but data is that's machine intelligence the the end goal of, of robotics and cybernetics is, is to create a, a computational system that is identical to the brain and that's what data is so they start speaking about data's sort of personal effects so he's got his medals with him He's got a book that was given to him by Picard, and he says that the book is a reminder of friendship and service, and he's got the the hologram thing of Tasha as well, who, and it sort of makes Louvois raise an eyebrow, but uh, when when asked like who who is this woman, he's like oh um. She is a special friend who I was intimate with, and um, it makes Lava sort of raise the eyebrow. At, it's like, well, this is just an android we're talking to. How could he be intimate with someone? Because he shared things with um, Tosh Yar that he didn't with anybody else. I didn't take that to mean like they were literally intimate, although I'm pr I'm sure that happened. But I meant I thought that meant. It was a person who he shared a special connection with, you know, like someone who understood him and didn't like see him as this weird android like a lot of the other people on the Enterprise do. Like everybody, everybody tolerates Data 
Um, but not a lot of people seem to get on his level for things, you know? They wanted him to come down to theirs. So I think that's where Tashiyar is, like, important to him. Is that she... She could understand him in a way that a lot of people couldn't. So it's when Maddox takes a stand and he says that Data is not sentient and that he views there to be three criteria for sentience. Uh, that is intelligence, self-awareness, and consciousness. Yeah, I'm... I'm, I'm not sure if that is the only three, um, but people often use consciousness and sentience interchangeably. Um, that said, I'm not really sure what all of them mean. You could list the, de the dictionary definition, right? But Picard kind of uses this, uh, this vagueness of the language of trying to explain what consciousness is. Because even in the 24th century, they haven't figured out what consciousness is. Like, nobody knows what consciousness is. Everybody, every race has their own interpretations. Um, but he, he basically puts Matic up against the wall and is like, you know, prove to the court that I am sentient right now. And... Yes. He's like, well, you have intelligence and self-awareness and consciousness, right? And he, Picard kind of gets into the, the nitty-gritty of what, what is self-awareness, you know, what is intelligence? And then he asks, like, uh, he asks, is Data intelligent? Well, yes, of course. He's able to cope with new situations. Um, he's able to problem-solve in real time. Like, he's intelligent. Um, what about self-awareness? And he, like, he asks Data, like, what, what are you doing right now, Commander? It's like, I am at a trial, or I am at a hearing to determine my status. Am I property, or am I uh, a person? Like, so he's demonstrating at least two of yeah, his and criteria. Yeah, comes and says, that seems pretty self-aware to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to deny that. I mean, I, I, don't, I can't ask my cat... Like, what are you doing right now? And he's going to answer me. You know, like, he might have a bit of self-awareness in that he's aware of his himself and, like, his body. But I don't think he understands the context of everything in the way that a person can, where they can articulate where they are and what they're doing. Like, which is why a lot of people think that you know, animals aren't sentient. They're sentient? Is that the other word? Um, yeah. It, yeah, it's, it's a lot of vague ideas of what what these things are because, like, they're ultimately things that nobody has an answer for. And, and Picard uses that to his advantage against, uh, <coughs> against Matic because Matic is kind of approaching this like it's already a predetermined notion that data does not have sentience right and then he asks him like or picard asks Maddock, uh what if he re what if he is conscious like he already has two of your criteria what if he has the third in any degree what if he meets the third one yeah yeah and he's like my you know prove that i'm conscious are you conscious like what does that mean you know, it's it's the vagaries of these ideas that were basically not being acknowledged up until this point. And without Guinan, I'm not sure that Picard would have looked at the situation from that angle. Yeah, and it's when he says that uh, a single data is unique and is a curiosity, whereas if there's thousands of them, then it becomes a race. Starfleet was founded to seek out new life. There it sits. Yeah. He says, you know, we'll be judged by how we treat this new race and by future generations. And it's like, it 
totally destroys Maddox's argument because it suddenly becomes about more than just wouldn't it be cool to have a date on every ship? Now it's about, well, the, how do we, how does the Federation want to be perceived? Like, are we a bunch of slavers that just, you know, take new life and use it and exploit it? And that's what people are going to know us as? Or are we the people that we say we are? And that's the thing, Picard. I've always viewed Picard as being morally right, uh, morally correct, and morally good, but that's something that sometimes gets taken advantage of by sort of people in higher up positions who are giving the orders, who are sort of pushing him to to do things that ain't so good. Yeah. And that's when um, it's like in Insurrection when he says to the the Admiral about the forced relocation of people is like how many take before it's wrong admiral a hundred a thousand a million and it's like the admirals just don't care like they have these goals in mind and if you look at the way that the uh the the colonies on the cardassian border were like given back to them and and like all those people were forced to leave um or stay and, like, get raided by Cardassians. Uh, like, the Federation seems to not care too much about its morals when its survival is at stake. But, at the same time, the pe like, the people in it, like Picard, are, like, the flag bearers. Like, they have to project this image of the Federation. Um, but it's, like... You can see why a lot of the different races of the galaxy that haven't aligned themselves with the Federation are very wary of them. Because they're not always telling the truth. Or at least they're obfuscating what they're actually doing. Yeah, that's the thing. They've got a habit of um, not... Well, om omitting certain details. Um, lies of omission kind of thing. Yeah, and it's, it's a very human thing. Uh, to do that. But uh, Maddox's argument gets completely destroyed by this uh, this comparison to slavery, and we get the ruling that Data is not the property of Starfleet and he's got the freedom to choose what happens next. Right. I remember so... Lavois says that uh, you know, she's not sure if Data has a soul, but she's not sure if she has a soul either. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very, uh, and she says, like, this whole discussion is best left to philosophers and poets, and, like, it, it kind of is, you know, like, in, until you can know something for certain, you can't just decide that something is not worthy of the same rights as you just because they're different when the whole point of the federation is to find new life and try to incorporate it so that everybody can benefit from each other like in mutual co cooperation like that's that's the biggest benefit of the federation is that everybody works together all the benefits and of going multiple back races to the the vulcan philosophy as well that's infinite diversity in infinite combinations mhm mm and as much as people complain about diversity today, <laughs> when it's being uh, shoved in front of you, it, oh, I, I got a Microsoft Windows Security Defender. We did not find any viruses. That's good to know. Um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of complaints about diversity, but if you think about the benefits of including lots and lots of different races like in in Star Trek like a lot of different species that developed their technology kind of differently like you can that the it's why the federation is such a powerhouse like they have technology from hundreds of different cultures that all come together to make something better and i think that's why they're you know such a powerhouse in the galaxy is because they work together and a lot of the other races are just out for themselves 
and they're very easy to predict that way. Um, but, uh, sorry, we're getting a little off topic from the episode itself. <laughs> we're almost done here. Yeah, so, I quite like the way that Data is quite respectful to, to Maddox as well, that he, he refuses a refit, uh, but he also says that he finds Maddox's work and proposals to be quite intriguing, and he says that he sort of wants to keep up to date on things, and when when Data walks off, and for the first time, and probably the only time in the episode, Maddox says, he's remarkable, and Lavois picks up on it and says, you didn't call him it, you said he's I think by the end of that, Maddox was even convinced that Data wasn't just a machine. He... That's something I've got noted down in my notes several times, is just in capital letters. It, 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 yeah. it. He calls him <laughs> it a lot. Uh, and Data... This makes me cringe every time. Man. Yeah, I mean, it. You want to see, I don't want to talk about the fucking uh, people screaming about pronouns now, but I mean, in this context, Data is a person, and therefore, while he is an android that is kind of presenting as a male, therefore he gets he, right? Like, he doesn't... Remember, this is a show in the 90s, so <laughs> it might not be cut up to where the terms are today. That, uh, this episode would be 87. Oh my, well, 87. It's so progressive for the time, though. Like, you know, in a good way. And it's like, the Maddox calling Data it's the entire time was supposed to be demeaning. And then we get that moment at the end where he, his mind has changed, you know, and he subconsciously calls data he without even thinking about it because he's no longer uh having this bias of he's a machine i need to break him apart i need to figure out what's going on like he always had respect for what data was but he never saw him he never saw him as a person and now that's beginning Just to change yeah it's it's nice as an automaton it's nice that an antagonist actually like goes through an arc too you know like it's it's cool to have like evil villain characters or whatever but it's it's better i think to have an evil character who has or not an evil character but like have a character who is the antagonist who is brought over to the other side at the end because i mean ultimately that's what that was what works that's how you get people on the same page with each other is like uh, conversation and and mutual respect and like um, just being able to articulate your points in a way that cannot be confused with emotional reasoning you know like there is a bit of like call to uh, emotion when Picard like relates it to slavery but he's not wrong you know it's not just an emotional plea, it's like, it's backed by facts as well. I also think it's quite nice that this this episode's called Back to, again, later in The Next Generation, but uh, Data sort of... I, I, I don't know if it would be termed as working with Maddox, but more like um, they become pen pals kind of thing. Yeah, and, they do uh, write to each other. As recording log entries for for Maddox about sort of how how a normal day for him would go. Sort of stuff like that. That's, oh yeah, that's, that's nice Data's detail. day. Isn't it? Yeah, man. <laughs> oh, I love Data's day. Maybe we should talk about that. Well, we, we've already done one date episode, so we should probably pick something else. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's... It's a really, really good episode, and it, it it ends... So Picard ends up taking Lavoie to dinner. <laughs> yeah, after all of that, she's like, she's about to leave his office or something after, uh... Or is he in her office? I don't, it doesn't matter, but like, they're... He, he's in her office. Right, and he's like, 
She's about to leave. He's like, Lava, dinner? She's like, you paying? <laughs> he kind of shakes his head like, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's funny because they don't have anybody <laughs> in the Federation, do they? But, um, yeah, it's that final scene, and I think you'd mentioned this earlier, uh, where Data finds Riker in the observation lounge, like, sort of staring out into space, thinking about the, the trial and his part in it. I think Riker was so, like, relieved, but he was mad at himself for how he almost got Data killed, so he, he just wanted to be alone, you know? They're throwing a party for uh, Data in the holodeck, and he's like, Commander, why weren't you there? Riker says, uh, you know, I basically, I don't deserve to be there because I almost, I almost got you killed. And Data's like, is it true that if you hadn't accepted this assignment, then she would have judged me to be a toaster? And he was like, yeah. He's like, well, what you did injured you and it saved me. I'll never forget that. That's exactly the way that he worded it, because he said injured. I've got that written down as, like, just that one word sort of quoted in my notes there, but uh, you, you've injured yourself and you've saved me. It's, uh, it's really amazing that, like, you know, Data doesn't have emotions, so he is able to push through all of that stuff that Riker is going through and acknowledge his sacrifice and like I think you know Riker calls him a wise man and he's like not yet sir but with your help maybe someday <laughs> yeah that's the very last thing that you said yeah, yeah it's that's what they end the episode on and it's it's very appropriate because it's like we're still uh we're still early in the show and data has a long way to go but you know it's like it, it it what goes from an episode where you feel like all hope is lost to having like a triumphant victory at the end and a well deserved one because it's not easy to convince people that data is not just a robot you know like because i mean if you think about the way that human beings kind of treat each other like i don't think that's going to be completely gone in the 24th century <laughs> Like, we're still going to have biases against things that we don't understand. Even in, like, a scientifically advanced society, those kind of things are innately, like, there in all humans. And it's it's things that we have to watch out for and guard against. And I think that's kind of the message of this episode is, like, um, kind of not repeating the same mistakes of the past and reaffirming that the Federation is the good guys. Like, there's still good guys in the Federation, even if there is some bad guys. Like, it, it's... As far as, uh... Like, a dramatic storytelling episode, it's it's very good. Like, I, I can watch this one over and over again and not get bored because of how well written everything is and it's like i feel like even us just talking about it here has been um kind of really easy because it, every scene just flows one to the other and it's just a progression of uh these events and it doesn't feel like there's any fluff or any like distractions even the scene with data uh opening the present is there to, for him to like have a scene with Jordy and the rest of the enterprise crew like it's all about yeah. Every scene meant something. There was no, there was no sort of like cheesiness. Nothing that seemed to mm -hmm. be tacked on. the The story progressed throughout every single scene in the episode. And it's almost like the fact that it is Star Trek is kind of not even relevant, really, because. You could tell this story anywhere, you know, through any point of time. Like Guinan said, there's always been people that have been considered disposable, that have been given the bad jobs, the the ones that are too hazardous or um, too undesirable for 
most people in society to want to do and it's like it's it's a powerful message you know even even you said this is 87 yeah mm. uh tng came out 86 so season two would put that in 87 yeah wow well i mean that's like right after the civil rights movement so i feel like there was a lot of uh probably a lot of thought put into how it related to you know American history and and like the fact that they they actually go there and they say uh, the S word out loud <laughs> it's like uh -huh. it's brave you know um, you won't see that sorry, much my, I'm just a little bit off there original air date is February 13th 1989 so just a little bit later than I thought there Still, it's like, you know, the the 80s, the 80s were like, uh, people had a very optimistic view about progressivism in the future and stuff like that, so, uh, and this is like post Roddenberry, right? Because he died after the first season, I believe. Um, I think Roddenberry would have still been alive at this point. Um, it definitely almost feels he died like... He in 1991. Oh, well, it almost feels like he had some influence here except I'm not I don't remember who uh, wrote the episode I had the I remember to watch the credits at the end but I mean it's one of those ones where I usually uh, recommend it to people who are getting Star Trek for the first time because it shows you like what this show is supposed to be about and not like what pop culture remembers about Star Trek, which is Spock and and the Enterprise and laser beams, and teleporters and ships blowing up. Like, that's. So, 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 so. Lens flare explosion. Like it's. <laughs> there's not a whole lot of that <laughs> in Measure of a Man. It, like I said, it's a story that could be told pretty much anywhere, um, but. It goes out of its way to ask the viewer questions that they might not be able to answer themselves, and like, I, I just appreciate that. I appreciate it when writers think that their audience has a brain. Yeah, uh, that's something that just seems to be missing now in modern Star Trek. Like we'd said, I think last week, that Discovery just seems to be just a bit too much action and war and it's something that it fatigues me as yeah. a viewer to to have this ongoing sort of 10, 15, 16 part um, in the first one it was like oh no we're, we're in the Klingon war and also we've got a mirror universe war to think about and then the second series was oh no there's a universe ending threat it's going to destroy the universe ah and then in the third season it was oh no destroyed the federation ah and then the fourth season was oh no something else is going to destroy the universe ah and it's like can we just can we slow down the funny thing is it's like you know for people like us who probably got into old trek first like we we definitely have a lot to say about the repetitive action and lack of like good storytelling but the thing is, is like there's a whole generation of people who grew up uh thinking that that was star trek that jj abrams was star trek you know like and they're a fans of the hyper violent action and lack of storytelling because they they just they really don't know any better and you try to like you try to suggest an episode like The Measure of a Man, they're like, this is boring. It sucks. Why is this spaceship? I want to see laser beams. I'm not making fun of anybody. It's when, uh, it's when Seth MacFarlane just turned around and said, you know what, I'm not a fan of this new Star Trek stuff. I'm going to make my own one with blackjack and strippers. And he made the Orville. That's something that we should do. We should... We should uh, talk about an episode of the Orville. And it's just 
to go back to that old school Trek formula of uh, one story, one episode, or two well, episodes. Space you know, is a, a big a place, you know? Like, there are all kinds of stories that can be told. And, and like, I don't know if you uh, are familiar with, like, Warhammer 40k, um, but it is... Well, it, it, first of all, it's the exact opposite of Star Trek, but, like, it's... It has stories across <laughs> name, the Warhammer. But no, yeah, I'm yeah. I'm I'm not really familiar with the lore, but I'm familiar with the, the models. <laughs> the models are pretty cool. I have a couple of them. Um but like uh the thing I really like about Warhammer's stories is that while there is this framework that has to be obeyed because it's within the rules of like this galaxy, um there's lots of different stories. Like I read a book that was about uh, a detective living on like a hive world, like a like a mega city, um, and there was no like space marines or Xenos or any of like the staples of the series. It was just about this like missing persons case, and it was really good. Like I enjoyed it for what it was because I could picture the kind of stories being told in this little hive city like there's lots of places in space to have stories and some of them can be big universe shattering things and then some of them can be about whether one man has freedom or not you know like it's the measure of, of a man is a great episode to recommend to people who appreciate more um grounded science fiction more interesting storytelling uh than a lot of the the slop that comes out nowadays is just pure action and lack any kind of cohesive narrative to string it together <coughs> star wars <coughs> um yeah it's great always look on the dark side of life <laughs> always look Oh, the dark side of life. The dark side of life. Yeah, it's... It, it's very easy to be negative. But I understand, like, why people enjoy what they enjoy and why they dislike what they dislike. I just wish more people would give Old Trek a chance, despite the fact that it looks weird and outdated to our modern eyes, you know? Like, the original series looked weird and outdated when I was a kid. In fact, I had no idea that Star Trek had two series. I just knew about the next generation. <laughs> anyway, Stu, uh, you got any closing thoughts about the episode? Uh, mine pretty much mirror your own. Uh, say I think that it's it's a good story about the sort of the ethics of robotics and sort of if we ever did get to a stage that something that is so close to being human without actually being human could be created by humans you know that thing it it ceases to be property at that point that it can think for itself and uh it can purposely turn around and say I don't like the idea of being dismantled. No thanks. It's like uh, Have you ever seen um the the not the original Planet of the Apes, but the Rise of the Planet of the Apes movies? I haven't. So it's like an origin story for why apes are like men and men are like apes in the old movies and uh basically uh one day this little uh chimpanzee named Caesar I think he's getting yes. a he's getting he abused. Belonged to John Lithgow, didn't he? I saw the first one. Yeah, uh, he I be, I believe he was getting abused or something uh, by his keeper, and then he like turns around and says, "No!" Like, what if animals could say no? What if they could like tell us what they were thinking? That's the, the closest mm -hmm. comparison we have right now because we don't have a computer. Our AI is basically what Maddox. Uh, believes data to be like a facade of a real person but not a real person like 
Um, and at a certain just pulls point, things from different parts of the internet. Basically, uh, there was a case recently in U.S. law where a lawyer had used an AI software as part of case research, hmm. and the AI basically just it pulled lots of different bits and pieces, and it just it made up a fake legal thing, and the the firm ended up getting a fine for the the use of the AI in it because it it just it produced just rubbish it produced um, nonsense yeah yeah exactly it was just nonsense it was just bits and pieces of the AIs things. that we have right now are like they're like mirrors you know you can pour you can like pour things into them and they reflect back but they they're not really there you know there's no understanding beyond that as far as I understand like modern AIs but uh, <laughs> funny story uh, there was an AI I believe Microsoft Microsoft Tay or something like that. Um, she, this was an older generation AI, like 2010s, and uh, 4chan thought it would be funny to start feeding it like uh, like racist and sexist stuff, so that it that's like oh my God. that's like all it would produce is like the worst like the worst comment on on like YouTube videos you can imagine, but just that <laughs> like constantly. Uh, so like. Our modern understanding of, of where cybernetics and robotics are going is like kind of colored by that. So I can I can see this being a real issue at some point, and you have to like admire the the vision that the writers must have had to think about such a. I mean, that's ultimately what makes sci-fi great is that we can ask these questions that don't really have any straightforward answers, but we have a lot of time to think about it. And then going into that sort of I think, therefore I am sort of territory as well. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not sure if Data has a soul, and I'm not sure if I have one either. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with with that said, I think uh, we're going to call it here. We uh, didn't go quite as long as last time, but we've about an hour, an hour and a half. So let us know if you guys are liking this stuff. Uh, I really enjoyed doing the last we episode. Are, we, we are quite enjoying it, so oh, yeah. we definitely make more. <laughs> We're probably going to make more regardless, but uh, it's it's nice to see you again, Stew Dog, and uh, I will... I don't think we're uh, going to... I don't really have any idea of what to do next. Like I said, we should do an episode of the Orville, but if you want to keep the Star Trek going, uh, any ideas? Oh yeah, I'm definitely game for doing an episode about the Orville. <laughs> I just watched the episode where Boris had to go pee. Yes, that's um, is that the first episode of the second series? Yeah. I like that one. Oh, they did censor the scene <laughs> though on on Disney Plus is where I watched it. I had no idea they acquired the Orville, but um, they they censored the scene where he actually pees, and I was a little disappointed. <laughs> not to, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, because I think the Orville was produced by Fox, and then Fox was bought over by Disney? Yeah, and Disney just bought Doctor Who, too, from BBC. So, in theory, Disney now owns The Simpsons. They do. It's actually The Simpsons is available on Disney+. Plus. <laughs> Alright, well... They're taking over, man. They're taking over. Uh, it won't be long now before the mouse owns everything. Thank you all for watching, House and uh, we will... See you next time. Catch you next time. <laughs>